I think this is a better open for our show, Steve. You're talking about just the music, right? You yeah. don't want you don't want the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, the rap, non-rap version, I don't think has lyrics at the start. This would be the open of our show. Almost has a little Seinfeld to it. Yeah. What do you think? Opposites attract. Perhaps. The new perhaps. people. Matt Park, what do you think about that? I think it sounds like uh, the opening to Sanford and Son. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's perfect for our show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There might be some truth there. Right. There might be some truth to that. Uh, all right, Voice of the Orange, Matt Park, joining us here as we continue to get you set uh, for Syracuse and Purdue. And, you know, we've been uh, saying on this show for several weeks, really even before the season started, that we're not going to learn a lot about this team until at least game three. Um, with that being said, Matt, do you think we're going to learn a lot about this team uh, come Saturday night at 730? I do. I think we've talked about this for a long time, being a big swing game and having a lot to say about the trajectory of the season. You win this, you're 3-0, and you're favored to be 4-0, and uh, and with Clemson coming in, and big things could come from that. You lose this one, uh, then your first two games didn't mean a whole lot. You're 1-2, uh, and and two and, or, I'm sorry, 2-1, and one, and um, if you can lose to Purdue, you can lose to Army, and that type of thing. Obviously, Purdue's better than Army, but... Um, you know, so I think it starts to make it. There's a lot of swing games on this schedule. So uh, as you approach them, you've got to uh, take care of business. And and I, I think each of these becomes a little bit of a test or a measuring stick uh, to give you an idea of what we should expect. You know, Syracuse has obviously been downright dominant through these first two games against lesser opponents. Um, you know, the defense outside that long run, the 75 yard run that, you know, they've, they've given up no points, uh, scored twice and given up a combined, whatever it is about 350 total yards in two games, you know, again, outside of that long run, do you think the defense is, is legitimate, legitimately a really good defense or, you know, again, does that, does that remain to be seen? I think a lot of it remains to be seen. I think they probably deserve a little more credit than they're getting. Uh, I'm up at Newhouse, Steve. I just had a, somebody knock on the door. Hey, how are we favored in this game? Well, because you just dominated two games and Purdue isn't the Packers. You know, uh, it's not like inconceivable to be favored in this game. You know, it uh, doesn't mean they're going to win it or that it's a layup. Um, I don't care if you're playing Central Square High School to not basically give up a first down. I mean, they hardly give it up a first down. They haven't let the ball cross the 50 basically in two games. So they're doing something right. Um, they've not played red zone defense. They've not played goal line defense. Uh, th- those things will come out in time and we'll get, uh, you know, you'll get exposed by better teams. You'll see other things arise. Uh, that's the difference in Colgate and Western. Western Michigan had the ability to, uh, have a little deception, make a guy miss, and then have a 75-yard run. Nobody on Colgate is likely to run for 75 yards against the Syracuse defense. Purdue will have people that obviously uh, can do that. So I think each new, you know, each week is a new uh, challenge or test. But I, I like the Syracuse players. I think they've got pretty good depth. You know, maybe not so much on on the line, but. Again, that's why they play the type of defense they do. Uh, And I I think we've just seen part of it to this point. So uh, I'm optimistic about what the defense can be. You mentioned uh, that Syracuse hasn't played red zone defense or goal line defense. Uh, And and we brought up this point on the show, and I want to get your thoughts on it. So Purdue's played two really close games, uh, both decided by a possession. One went their way, one went the other way. Syracuse has played two games that were over by halftime. Will that matter Saturday night if it becomes a fourth quarter game? The fact that Purdue has been in the crunch time this year, and again, Syracuse played a lot of close games last year, so you know the guys have been exposed to it. They just haven't been exposed to it this year. Does that give Purdue a little bit of an edge that they've played in, in these two close games that Syracuse hasn't? Uh, I would say uh, you can, on one hand, look at it just maybe slightly that it's an edge. I, I could make the argument for Syracuse having a, a little bit of an advantage in that area, too. It's not like these guys you know, forget Sure. What it takes to win close games and that type of thing. They also haven't been exposed to it. Um, so I'm a little more concerned. The fact that the first two games haven't been close, I'm a little more concerned about the staying power of a long, you know, a three and a half hour game that's going to take your concentration and stamina um, until 11 p.m. 
you know, Eastern time or whatever on, on Saturday night because the, you know, Garrett Schrader is obviously a gamer. I don't think he's any real concern, but you got to think about the number of plays that are going to be required to win a close game on the road. And these guys haven't really done it when you're pulling the quarterback at halftime and the running back and you're working in different offensive line pieces. So it's not like, oh my gosh, it's a one possession game. We're going to melt down. Uh, I just think it's more a matter of sort of seeing it through and Purdue has been, you know, has been at that level or has been tested all the way through its first two games. I'm sure that you were anticipating this question at some point. Uh, Aranda Gadsden, uh, your thoughts, uh, you know, do you anticipate that he'll be out there? Do you anticipate they, they, they hold him out for this one? Uh, you know, I don't have any real advanced knowledge anymore than anybody else on this one. My gut tells me he's not going to play. Uh, I, I do think they're trying everything they can. Uh, when you see a guy in a boot, it's funny, the Aaron Rodgers thing is obviously the, the biggest football injury in, in recent memory. And I actually was on the phone or something and didn't didn't get to the TV until after he'd already kind of gotten to the locker room and I'm picking up the news that he's out of the game. Well, he had a boot on him by the time he got to the locker room. It's, it's an automatic treatment for that type of injury, ankle, Achilles, that type of thing. So I think that it's the uh, it's a kind of injury that looks worse than it is. So I'm not reading a ton into uh, Gaston being treated that way on Saturday. Um, I don't know how quickly he's healing and, and getting back on his feet and, and able to do anything. So I'm not holding my breath on seeing him play in this one. I, I also think the credit belongs to some of these other guys for becoming options and developing second, third, fourth wide receiver that at least in the short term you can get by with. Uh, obviously your team's better with Gadsden than without, but uh, we'll, we'll see. You know, the, the, they're going to take, it's going to be the other guys no matter what, even if he is available, but I, I don't expect him being a factor and, in this one. And that leads me perfectly into my next question. I was going to ask you about the other guys. Uh, you know, Gadsden aside, that was one of our big questions, right? Coming into this year was, you know, who would who would be the, the Robin to his Batman? And, and, you know, again, he may not be there Saturday night, but we have seen other guys step up. We've seen uh, eight other receivers. Uh, I think they've had 11 other pass catchers when you take into account the running backs, but eight other receivers have caught a pass. Donovan Brown, for instance, has looked good. Um, Isaiah Jones back from injury, he's looked good. Uh, who has impressed you here in the early going through two games uh, as you know somebody who's maybe uh, you know maybe you're you're intrigued by? I would say Brown is the guy who is in the category of didn't really know what to expect or to count on him for this year, and he's been productive. And I'll say I'm still a Damian Alford fan. Uh, I think. You know, he looks great getting off the bus, and he's a guy who should be a dangerous weapon at this level. He's the guy that Florida State and Louisville have had a hundred of in in recent years. It just blows my mind that he can make the catches he can make and then drop one on the goal line, but he's not the first person in football history that's had that affliction, and uh, maybe he can shake it, you know? So uh, I, I think... I'd rather go to war with people that I, yes, you want people to be steady, but I want people that are capable. You want to know, you know what, what's the best thing you're uh, capable of doing. And, and he can make tough catches uh, with the best of them. So uh, I still think there's something there. Yeah, that catch he made along the sidelines right after he dropped that wide open touch. I mean, that was that was one of the more difficult catches you'll see, uh, the catch he made along the sidelines. It was good to see him bounce back, though. Isaiah Jones, similar thing, dropped a pass and then uh, caught a really tough one uh, along the goal line against Western Michigan. Uh, as we look at this opponent, Matt, uh, it's a different team, right? Uh, seven starters uh, gone on defense, uh, stud quarterback, stud wide receiver, head coach, you know, all gone. What can you tell us about this Purdue team? And I, I guess let's start with Hudson. And car the new quarterback. Yeah, I think it's a reminder that uh, no matter what the driving force was behind the coaching change, you're bound to take a step back uh, in personnel, especially now. And this is a team that won eight games last year, won six conference games, and they are pretty good. They have lost people, and they lost their coach, but it wasn't because they underperformed and, you know, won three or four games. They won eight games last year. Uh, but there is this transitory nature of, like, 
they're in transition, obviously. You, you, uh, coaching staff change means uh, different schemes, different players in and out. Uh, their top two quarterbacks are both transfers from other major conference schools. You know, Hudson Card was so highly recruited. The physical gifts are there. The production really wasn't uh, there for the most part uh, in his time at Texas. Their leading running back is a walk-on. I, I, and Devin Mockaby, I think that's a little bit of an indictment probably on how well they've recruited at that position, but he's been very good for a year and a half or two years. And uh, I, I think they have material. It's just uh, obviously a little bit of a, a setback for him and a learning process. Is there a certain matchup uh, that you are uh, you know, going to be looking at uh, on Saturday night? A certain matchup you think maybe decides this game, whether it's you know two position groups or two you know players going at it? What, what, do, you, what do you think yeah. matchup-wise? Well, it always, you know, for me, I think it comes down to uh, the, the performance of the lines. I think with Syracuse obviously having to shuffle, we know Dave Willow is going to have to be out. Uh, is anybody coming back yet? Uh, the, the sense I get, I don't have a definitive uh, answer on that, but the sense I get is not good. So I don't think there's any returnees from that camp with uh, Kalen Ellis or, or uh, Joe Moore. So um, I think – you know, how good is the Syracuse offensive line in their first real test? Uh, how well does the Syracuse defensive line uh, play against uh, some big boys and, and that kind of thing? So I think that's where uh, this one could well be determined in terms of uh, pass protection and, and that type of thing. And um, I think Syracuse is a pretty good special teams unit. We're going to talk with Bob Leshevsky on the show tonight. And uh, I think can they make a play there or show some dominance in a way that can help you win one on the road. Yeah, since you brought up the kicking game, I know it's you know not always sexy to talk special teams, but the kicking game has been solid, right? We didn't totally know what to expect out of the punting situation or the you know place kicking situation. It's you know I know it's Colgate in Western Michigan, but it's been solid, right? Yeah, it's been great. I mean, there there have been a couple bobbles and you know one boo boo return, one botched uh, hold. So, there, yeah, there's been a couple things like that. But uh, I think they've been great. Kickers are great so far. Uh, you know, I heard you say on the show one time, and I would agree with it, Steve. But, you know, yes, rushes and things can be a little different, but kicking is kicking. And uh, I think you're um, they're in well positioned with those two guys, well equipped. Nothing really they've seen so far has exposed them for much of anything. Let's see with uh, Brady Denenberg going outdoors now. Uh, how easy the touchbacks come, but but they've been routine at home. So uh, that, that part of it, uh, to me, is very good. And then one of the things I'll ask Ligaszewski about tonight is kick coverage. It's been taken out of the game. There just really aren't that many returns, but you have to be vigilant every time, right? <laughs> you can't think, well, nobody's ever going to return it because that, that's the opportunity that you're giving the opponent to rip one off. So uh, we'll, we'll watch that part of it, and uh, special teams can always turn a game. All right, uh, 7.30 kick in West Lafayette on Saturday night. But uh, first up, Dino Baber's show tonight at Heritage Hill. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for coming out. We appreciate it. We'll all be tuning in tonight. Sounds good, guys. Thanks. All right. The Voice of the Orange. Matt Park. And with that, we'll hit our final timeout. We will wrap things up next on ESPN Radio.